And so I think that the, you know, the development of artificial intelligence in one sense is the search for an understanding of who we are. And, and I think we're getting a lot better tools and a lot more understanding of who we are as we develop this technology. And that is something to be both very excited by <laughs> and extremely scared of. Do you have any thoughts as far as like manufacturing and AI, especially in the form of like robotics? Do you see anything in forms of like regulations that you would like recommend or want to see or anything like that? So I would highly recommend anyone who is interested in the field of artificial intelligence and just thinking about how technology is evolving to read two books. One of them is The Rational Optimist by Matt Ridley. And then the second one is also by Matt Ridley, How Innovation Works. These are two incredible resources that help you to understand how complicated technology comes into existence. And the the short answer that I can give you without, you know, going through a very long and detailed explanation is that the way that we are able to maintain the technology that we have and build new and more advanced technology that allows us to have more freedom, more free time, more prosperity, which is the thing that we need in order to solve the crises at hand, like climate change, for instance. Um, you need to maximize the proximity of people to one another. So you need more people uh, in closer proximity with more freedom to make choices that allows them to uh, you know, maximize their consumption for the things that they find personally valuable. And so I think regulations that don't take that into effect that are more isolationist, for instance, the regulations that India has right now on trade, I think are actually detrimental to the economic development of India as a nation. And while it's understandable to be protectionist, and there, there is some justification what will take the US China trade relationship, for example. Um, I think it is important for us not to allow the Chinese government to subsidize products and services in the US market that the companies themselves could not sustain. You know, if a Chinese company can't sustain providing a product or service without being subsidized by the government, that's probably not a product or service that we should allow to compete with products or services that are produced here in the United States because that is not a long-term sustainable future. And what will end up happening is that they will end up capturing market share from us that destroys our own production capability at home but in a way that then after that's destroyed, they can hike up the prices and just, you know, that is not a generative, cooperative, long-term beneficial thing. On the flip side, if companies are legitimately able to outcompete products and services that are produced here in the United States uh, in a sustainable way with fully internalized costs, we should not try to prevent those products and services from having access to our markets. And so I think that's just kind of a general set of principles that we should operate by. And that's going to actually include further automation of all sorts of tasks by robots moving forward. Um, and one of the cool things is that here in the United States, we have a vibrant technology sector and a vibrant venture capital ecosystem that allows a lot of really cutting edge stuff to happen here. And I'm extremely excited, you know, for example, that TSMC is going to be bringing some chip fab capacity here to the US as well. I think we we do need to try and incentivize some robustness in the supply chain that, you know, doesn't exist today. So I, I think that subsidies in those types of areas for the purpose of, you know, just trying to create resiliency uh, in, in our supply chains, that that is good because we are very, very interdependent in a way that, you know, going back to the, the Matt Ridley point, our TSMC today is a pinnacle of human achievement that only exists in a world where we have the type of interdependent international relationships that are characterized primarily by peace and open and free trade. If we move into a world where we have much less peace and much less free trade, 
the ability of TSMC to operate becomes very, very limited and or ceases to exist. The vast majority of all of the technological progress that we are building today depends on the existence of TSMC. That without their ability to produce chips, like we basically go into a technological dark age. And so, yeah, it's important to try and build in redundancy into our supply chains so that we don't have single points of failure like that. And that is unfortunately something that, you know, sometimes gets competed away in certain cycles of the market until you have some turbulence. And then all of a sudden that resiliency and that redundancy uh, becomes apparent that it's necessary and, and you get a, a different wave of investment. And in, um, so a, a lot of these same principles, I think they're going to apply to the way that we think about supply chains where AI is doing a larger and larger fraction of the work, um, whether that is physical labor, whether that's knowledge work uh, in, in a variety of different scenarios. I love that you brought up Matt Ridley's book. Um, <laughs> I have been purchasing books at a rate at which I've never purchased books before uh, because I think knowledge is power and we need knowledge more than ever. We're just in an era where, I mean, everything as we know is going to change thanks to AI. Yeah. And so this book was recommended in Peter Diamandis's book, Abundance, which I love. And I really like um, that somebody looks at optimism the way what Matt Ridley does from a rational perspective. It's like, oh, you can be an optimist because there's so much negativity out there around just the idea of work done by robotics. Well, that means humans are going to die. That means all the fish are going to die. Like I've heard the worst of the worst scenarios. Now, hold on. It hasn't even happened yet. Let's have a little optimism, people. So I do love that book by Matt Ridley, and I'm going to have to get the other book you mentioned. It was called, what was it called again? Innovation? How Innovation Works. So that, that kind of will, will lead us into this uh, next spot. We, we, we talked about chips. Uh, you talk about, we talked about regulation. Yeah. The next thing that I want to kind of cover is looking in the form of like robotics and AI systems and combining those together and thinking about it from the perspective of like sentience. What do you think about robots becoming sentient? And I mean more than just AI systems. We're mm -hmm. talking about like physical embodiment of these AI systems into a way where we have enough compute to create enough simulated AI personality to where it actually seems like it's sentient. What, what are your views there? What do you see? What are you thinking on that? I will say that, mm -hmm. you know, Moore's law implies, you know, something like a 30x increase in compute power every 10 years. And that's the law that has governed the development of general purpose computing since the dawn of, you know, computers in the 40s, 50s, 60s until today. That what NVIDIA is doing right now is so far beyond Moore's law mm -hmm. that it's yeah. impossible for our human minds to grasp. So the DGX supercomputer that Jensen delivered to OpenAI when Elon Musk was, you know, still involved in that venture uh, with Sam Altman and Ilya and, you know, Greg and <clears throat> that core team, the DGX systems that they are able to deliver today are, I, I saw a tweet recently that quoted it as 3,600 times more powerful than that. And that was eight years ago. So we're not even to 10 years yet. Wow. And we're taking that 30 and we're multiplying it by 120. And that's the factor of the acceleration in computing power that we have in GPUs. And the the thing that, you know, your viewers will want to understand about the difference between CPUs and GPUs or what are really becoming um, not even GPUs, but just neural net accelerators yeah. is that CPUs are serial processing units and they they do all of their work in a series of steps and you can't move to the next step until you have completed the last step. And that's not how our brains function. We have billions and billions of neurons in our minds yep. and they are all firing on and off in these complex patterns, uh, but in parallel. And then that operation in parallel builds up to the experience that we have. And that's the type of computing that Jensen has been focused on the entire time that NVIDIA has been in existence that he 
understood that parallel computing, even though it was a very early field at the time that he began, offered novel ways to solve problems that serial computing never would. And he has been on a quest to build the most powerful parallel computing platforms possible so that he could solve problems that serial computing could never solve. And um, that started with graphics, that graphics was just an early application that allowed him to really develop these computers, these GPUs. Um, but there was a lot of other things that he had ambitions for. And that's what led him to be in the position to be able to deliver the first DGX system to OpenAI in the first place. And that has kind of unlocked a whole new wave of computing and now, you know, the capabilities of open AI and of DeepMind that almost all of this cutting edge research in AI happens on NVIDIA hardware. And it's because NVIDIA has been trying to create the platform for these types of problems to be solved. Just going back to that rate of progress, we're moving at a rate of progress right now that is hundreds of times faster than anything else that we've experienced for the last 70 years. And people don't understand this because we're so early in that curve mm -hmm. that we can't tell how fast the underlying mm -hmm. technology is moving. So I, I don't have any way of knowing whether or not, you know, artificial intelligence is going to be sentient or what the quality of that uh, sentience is going to be. What we have today in the form of large language models that are very intelligent that we can interact with, um, those are definitely not built in a way that they mimic human intelligence or consciousness. They are great, useful tools. But if the underlying technology continues to progress at the rate that it's been progressing, I don't see how something incredible does not come into existence on the substrate of this computing platform that is so far beyond anything that we've created in the past. But I think that one of the fun and interesting things about artificial intelligence is that as soon as a computer is capable of doing a task, we classify it as not intelligent any longer. So whether that is chess, you know, whether that is go, uh, the next one is going to be whether it's driving that, um, I've started to be, I've started to think about what we define as consciousness or intelligence as the thing that computers can't do. And so all of this mm -hmm. research that we're doing in artificial intelligence, I think is the process by which we discover what consciousness is by first discovering all the things that it's not that we thought it was. And so I think that there's going to be a lot of things that we think of as human. There's going to be a lot of things that we think of as intelligence. And there's even going to be a lot of things that we think of as consciousness that are features of something that's much more complicated uh, and much more nuanced that is the real substrate of existence. Um, and so I think that the, you know, the development of artificial intelligence in one sense is the search for an understanding of who we are. And, and I think we're getting a lot better tools and a lot more understanding of who we are as we develop this technology and that is something to be both very excited by <laughs> and extremely scared of. Everything you just said, my goodness, we're so thrilled to have you on the show. I don't think I've heard it explained better. A couple of things I would add to that. I've had some really good comments on my YouTube videos on AGI. And one person said this, you'll both love it. They said, in a single leaf, there is a quantum computer. We've been trying to understand that for centuries. And so what you just said, like we're getting so much closer to understanding human intelligence. And a lot of this is fueled by the quest for that. Um, something that I read in one of these <clears throat> books I'm reading on computer science was how in the 40s, there was a neurophysiologist, Warren McCulloch, and a mathematician called Walter Pitts. And together they wrote this paper on how neurons in the brain work and they modeled a simple neural network off of that using electrical circuits and they called it a thinking machine. So in the forties, we were drawing this on a piece of paper and you know, those people were called crazy because there was absolutely no way a computer could handle even a fragment of that capability. But Ray, Ray Kurzweil, um, people that worked with, Ray Kurzweil, Marvin Minsky, they saw it. And it's interesting. It's just 
I think we see the product of some incredible visionaries. And just like you said, you said something that's so true, Hans. You said, you know, we're in an era where we've left old computing behind, but people still don't know it. That is the truth. And I think we're into this new era at such incredible high speeds. It's hard to actually see the road because we're just moving so fast. So I think just to slow down and understand this is how we could, one of the best favors we could do ourselves and just treat this like you said at the beginning, you know, know nothing kind of come into it like that. Okay, well, what's the story here? And understanding the pathway. But I just think everything you explained was so well said.